Streamlined plots, ignoring lore, and cutting characters might spice things up on screen, but these changes to the Dune films left fans of the original book wanting so much more. In the novel, Frank Herbert frames the story with narration from Princess Irulan. While Herbert's prose jumps between the story's main players, notes from Irulan's diegetic writing serve as the glue holding the ambitious plot together. Epigraphs from Irulan's later works of history give color to each chapter. These stylistic flourishes give the narrative of Dune the flavor of an official account taken from within its own universe. While both the 1984 and 2021 adaptations include narration, they both feature different narrators. In David Lynch's 1984 film, Princess Irulan, played by Virginia Madsen, introduces the universe of Dune and quickly explains the importance of spice before the opening title. In Denis Villeneuve's 2021 version, a voiceover from Chani opens the movie and introduces the struggle of the Fremen people to the audience. Her narration is represented as part of the ongoing dreams consuming Paul Atreides. In each film, the narration gets the audience up to speed on the conflict over Melange, also known as Spice, that drives Dune's universe. While neither film's narrations serve the same purpose as Irulan's in the novel, both versions do attempt to give an entry point to the enormous world the audience enters. It'll be interesting to see how much of this changes when Florence Pugh's Princess Irulan appears in Dune Part 2. Gurney Hollick, War Master of the House of Atreides, appears in both the 1984 and 2021 adaptations. While both films represent the character's loyalty and military might, neither quite nails the character's warrior poet traits. In the novel, Halleck is often reciting poetry, singing, or playing an instrument called the balisette. Music, then? No music! In both films, directors Lynch and Villeneuve seem to stress the character's warrior side more than his poetic aspect. The 1984 version, with Patrick Stewart starring as Halleck, uses Stewart's natural theatrical talent to smooth out Halleck's hardened edges. In the 2021 adaptation, Josh Brolin plays Halleck as all business. Smile, Gurney. I am smiling. In a roundtable with reporters, Villeneuve confirmed that he actually did film a scene of Halleck playing and singing the balisette, but opted to cut it for part one. Not many people make movies quite like David Lynch. For an example of Lynch's one-of-a-kind influence on his Dune adaptation, fans need to look no further than the heart plugs worn by the Harkonnen servants. From their initial appearance, Lynch wastes no time ensuring that the audience is immediately repelled by the Harkonnen brood. Just when viewers think the Harkonnen boys can't get any grosser, the Baron calls a servant with a brass key surgically implanted into his chest into the room. After accosting the boy, the Baron removes the key, blood comes pouring out, and the servant dies. In true Lynch fashion, the heart plugs are never explained or even mentioned. However, the visceral nature of the device is so grotesque that to behold it tells the audience everything they need to know about the Harkonnens. Only a mad genius like Lynch could devise something that makes these villains even more vile than Frank Herbert ever did. Lynch also opens his dune with a meeting between the Emperor of the Known Universe, Padishah Emperor Shaddam Corino IV, and a Spacing Guild navigator. The scene does not appear in the novel, but it quickly establishes Lynch's vision for a dune universe that looks like a combination of sci-fi pulp covers and abstract painting. Even though the scene's essentially an exposition dump, Lynch's bizarro creature and set design make a dialogue-heavy scene a grotesque treat to watch. Duncan Idaho's chemistry with Paul, his physicality during fight sequences, and moments of levity bring a ton of energy to Jason Momoa's character. Hey, you. Put on some muscle? I did? No. Idaho is a fan favorite, so when he dies at the hands of Sardaukar warriors, it's no surprise that it's an emotional highlight and a standout action set piece all at once. In the novel, however, Idaho's death occurs during a chapter following Paul's perspective, so Paul and the audience don't get to see Idaho's last stand against the Sardaukar. The film also raises the emotional stakes of Idaho's death by having Idaho close the door between the Atreides and the Sardaukar. Paul seals the door himself in the book. Small changes like these are what give Idaho's death its wallop on the big screen. Villeneuve spends a sizable portion of the first act developing the relationship between Duncan and Paul. Because the relationship is better developed on screen, the audience feels the impact the decision has on Paul when Duncan sacrifices himself to save the young Duke. After losing all of his father figures, Paul must prepare to take responsibility for his survival, the future of House Atreides, and eventually a battle with the Harkonnens. The 2021 version of Dune does a lot of work to put the first Atreides family at the center of the story. This helps audiences empathize with the good and noble Atreides and despise the despicable and grotesque Harkonnens. However, focusing on the family members also means giving less attention to some of the family's key advisors, like the Mentats. In the novel, Mentats for House Atreides and House Harkonnen advise the leaders of both houses and figure more prominently in the plot. Mentats are essential because their continued consumption of the spice melange turns their brains into supercomputers. They're responsible for all things involving strategy, probability, and logistics. While the Mentats for both warring factions are included in the film, neither receives much screen time. In fact, the characters are never even called Mentats on screen. 
Sai, I failed you today. There's no excuse. You have my resignation. In an interview with the Los Angeles Times, Villeneuve explained that cutting down on characters like the Mentats was a deliberate choice to ground the first movie more in Paul's experience. The Fremen, the indigenous people of Arrakis, have many interesting traditions yet to be explored in the latest adaptation. It's likely more of their customs will be explored in part two, but the first film passes on a chance to depict an important ceremony. May thy knife chip and shatter. Like the film adaptation, the novel sees Paul duel with Jameis. However, after Jameis' death in the novel, Herbert dedicates all of Chapter 34 to presenting a Fremen funeral and its implications for Paul. Fremen funerals, or water preservation ceremonies, are all about water. During the ritual, Jameis' water is distilled into a bulging sack, weighed and reclaimed as the tribe's water, which shows just how important water is to the Fremen. While the latest adaptation of the water preservation ceremony may not appear until Dune Part 2, any curious viewers can check out Lynch's take on the ceremony, which appeared in a deleted scene. Both the 1984 and 2021 Dune adaptations cast actors who were older than their counterparts in the novel. In the book, characters like Paul, Fade Routha of House Harkonnen, and Shani Kynes are all part of the up-and-coming generation behind current leaders, making the story a coming-of-age tale. Paul is 15 years old at the beginning of the novel. Interestingly enough, the actors playing Paul in both films, Kyle MacLachlan in 1984 and Timothy Chalamet in 2021, were both in their mid-20s when their versions were released. The same goes for its female leads. Chani has been portrayed twice on the big screen by women in their mid-20s, Sean Young of Blade Runner fame in 1984 and Zendaya in the latest adaptation. McLaughlin and Young in particular simply don't pass as teenagers. While the pair's performances fit well into Lynch's absolutely gonzo sci-fi vision, their apparent age makes the story seem centered around the adults. In the 2021 version, the leads look young enough to be older teens, so the coming-of-age story present in the novel remains in the more recent film. One of the most compelling features of Dune is its preoccupation with hand-to-hand -hand combat. By envisioning a world where most combatants rock a projectile-proof body shield, Frank Herbert created a necessity for blades. While the latest adaptation contains several scenes showing the importance of sword and knife fighting in the Dune universe, David Lynch's version goes a different route. Put the weirding module on him. The weirding module, a weapon which essentially turns sound into a weaponized laser beam, doesn't appear in Herbert's novel. The weapon serves as a stand-in for the martial arts and powers practiced by the witches of the Bene Gesserit, known as the Weirding Way. Lynch turns the Weirding Way into a means to deal out physical damage with one's voice. In other words, the 1984 version replaces the Bene Gesserit's unique combat abilities with voice-activated ray guns. This change ends up de-emphasizing the importance of hand-to-hand -hand combat in the movie. The attention to blade combat is a huge part of what makes the book's vision of the far future so fascinating and different from other sci-fi worlds. Luckily for fans, a 2021 adaptation did away with the weirding modules and delivered some truly epic sword fights. In the book, Paul's nemesis Fade Routha appears the first time readers encounter the Harkonnens. While Routha is present throughout Lynch's version, he is entirely absent from Villeneuve's 2021 adaptation. Routha is an awesome villain because he acts as a twisted reflection of Paul. Like Paul, Routha is a skilled warrior, extremely intelligent, and the heir apparent to a powerful family. Unlike Paul, Routha is also one sick puppy. In the book, he spars to the death with Harkonnen slaves for fun. He was also raised by the most cunning, ruthless, and power-hungry uncle to ever wear anti-gravity pads, Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. While Paul struggles to wield his new power for all things good, Routha can't wait to seize power to do all things bad. All I can see is an Atreides that I want to kill. While some fans might have been disappointed with Routha's absence in the latest adaptation, they can rest assured he'll appear in the sequel. Elvis star Austin Butler is taking on the role. Fans of the novel will likely notice that Baron's full plot to undermine House Atreides is streamlined in both the 2021 and 1984 adaptations of Dune. The book goes into a lot more detail about the Baron's full scheme to reclaim Arrakis. The linchpin of the Baron's plan is Dr. Yue. Wellington Yue is the trusted in-house physician of House Atreides. The Baron has Dr. Yue's wife, Wana, abducted to gain leverage over the doctor. However, the Baron also plans to sow discord in the Atreides camp by pitting the Atreides Mentat against Duke Leto Atreides' wife, Jessica. The idea is that Atreides human computer and resident witch will be too busy snooping on each other to pick up Dr. Yue's scent. While it's hard to know exactly why some plot threads are cut and others are kept during adaptations, both film versions streamline the Baron's plot to focus solely on Yue. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, as Dr. Yue's storyline is both compelling and tragic. However, simplifying the Baron's plan paints the Baron to be a bit more ruthless than he is cunning. He's still terrifying to behold in any version, but he definitely reads a bit smarter on the page. 
Dune is a best-selling sci-fi novel for many reasons, but its deep lore is definitely a strong selling point for fans. One aspect of the novel's lore that hasn't made it to the big screen in its entirety is the universe's detailed economic system, although Lynch's version did mention it in a deleted scene. We know of Chome, yet we are the secret. The Dune universe is ruled by the Padasha Emperor and governed by the Council of Great Houses called the Landsrad. All of these houses, including the Imperial House, participate in the open market of trading goods and services across the galaxy. Because the Dune universe is ruled by money, much like our own, real political power comes from a given house's stake in the Combine Onet Ober Advancer Mercantiles, or the Chome Company. Essentially, any house with a bigger piece of Chome's pie than the Emperor can shirk his rule and do whatever they want. The conquest for economic supremacy drives the plot as much as any of its other essential elements. While it's definitely a complex system, it gives Herbert's universe a level of specific detail a lot of other sci-fi properties lack. Both film adaptations have simplified the complexities of interstellar economics, but maybe Dune Part 2 will introduce the Chome Company to the delight of dedicated fans everywhere.